Okay, I'll get us started then. Um, welcome everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, this is our presentation called Washing Away Barriers. Uh, I'll give that credit to Ben, that was a pretty good one. Um, <laughs> Approaches for transformative wash service delivery in fragile contexts and vulnerable populations. Okay, so I'll give a brief rundown, kind of uh, introducing who is here for us, and what our format will be, and kind of what our presentation is going to be talking about. And then we'll move into our awesome uh, experts and presenters. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Dolliger. Uh, I am a wash in fragile context project manager for World Vision. Uh, we also have Jordan, Andreas, Zacharias, Nabule, Christy, Elise, and Ben, and they will all kind of introduce themselves more and have more info about what they do when they come up. So today we are going to be talking about what is wash in fragile context. We're going to be talking about our World Vision's intentional focus. Uh, and what I'm most excited about are the examples from our national office staff and partners, especially IDE, who's with us today. Um, so we're, we're going to be talking about challenges in Ethiopia, uh, challenges with poverty, Jesse, and climate in Zimbabwe, uh, and IDE's work in Bangladesh. So after that, we will talk briefly about how we're learning from these efforts, uh, what we're doing. Louder? Okay. I don't know if this is really very... hold it close to you. Okay. I promise it was louder earlier. Okay. <laughs> really? Yeah. Right up. Good? Better. Okay. Great. Um, but yeah, we'll be talking about how we're learning uh, from these efforts, and we'll go right into some small group discussion uh, that should be really interesting with the PAC group. So thank you all for being here. We'll adjust on the fly if we need to. Uh, after that, we will do report back, summary, and close. So we're going to try to learn something from this, and it should be a lot of fun. So we'll get right into it. We have a video. Did you hit the links? Solutions for sustainable development come in all shapes and sizes. In many settings, regional stability offers higher assurance that our actions will produce their intended outcomes. In fragile contexts, political instability, climate change, and violent conflict destabilize the terrain. Our actions have less guaranteed outcomes, while progress gained frequently crumbles as the problems accumulate in a cascade of setbacks. What does this look like in the real world? It's long-term droughts resulting in crop failure. As the region struggles towards economic turnaround, criminal raids, and severe flooding destabilize the system again. International aid efforts increase only to have the path towards stability disrupted by a failed election, leading to violence and mass displacement. 
Fragility is a cycle that traps communities and complicates development. World Vision is committed to support communities in the most fragile contexts as they work towards stable paths of development. This requires that we adapt our WASH programming for different strategies that reduce vulnerability to cycles of fragility. In more than 25 of these countries, our local experts and partners use contextualized approaches to meet their region's specific challenges. Robust plans can be quickly adapted because of their long-term experience in these rapidly changing landscapes. Rather than measuring progress only by observing household status, we also target and track in contextual factors and vulnerability measures themselves. Most importantly, we have shifted the focus of our activities and evaluations from only outputs to include process, systems, and sustainability. Our WASH programming in fragile contexts makes progress because of long-term investments from World Vision staff and partners. Their experience shows the way forward to those of us living outside these contexts. Join with us as we develop effective approaches and advocate for increased investment in these areas. Together we can plan, adapt, and learn how to meet the challenges of fragile contexts with practical solutions. All right, so um, we are very happy with that video. Uh, it was a recent uh, introduction to our resources regarding fragile context. Um, we will have a QR code at the end of the presentation that will have a link to that video if you wanna go back and look at it more and other uh, resources that we have uh, around the, con the conference. So we'll go really quick into what is fragile context. And I'm sure here in this room, there's a, a variety of experiences regarding this. Um, so we'll kind of just get on the same page as we talk about this uh, for the next hour and a bit. Uh, so fragile context is a geographic area where political climate and social pressures make people vulnerable to conflict and fractured institutions that should be protecting them. So it's a structural thing. It's often characterized by violence, disasters, and instability that impact social, political, and economic life across the country. In fragile contexts, children and families suffer extreme levels of climate impact, violence, exploitation, abuse, and neglect. Fragility can cover many nations or only a few neighborhoods and can change rapidly. That's a really important point for us. Uh, it's not a national metric. It can be very, very subnational uh, down to the district and community level. And that can be really hard to measure and really hard to talk about. Uh, so most of the language surrounding fragile context is on a national level, on conflict, on political and uh, economic instability, but it can be very, very much more uh, localized. And it has a major effect on children and families, which is our World Vision's focus. So for us, WASH specifically in fragile context is conflict, extremism, violence, displacement, environmental challenges, and climate change, uh, especially natural disasters, flooding, drought, uh, and political and economic instability in weak institutions that should be providing for their uh, people. And so those are kind of the three overgeneralized buckets that we have that we kind of use uh, to talk about this. So that's what we'll be using moving forward. Uh, at World Vision, we have made a really strong push recently to uh, really double down and learn from our work in fragile context. We are we're present in so many different countries across the world. Uh, and I'll let Jordan talk about that a little bit later on our overall strategic imperative. But our goal has been really to uh, demonstrate that scope and the impact that our WASH work has uh, in fragile context, specifically in the highest ranking countries that we work in, which is almost all of them. So uh, throughout this effort, we've been uh, prioritizing strategic funding specific funding projects uh, in countries like Bangladesh and Mozambique and Burundi uh, to really try to learn from what that impact is of a WASH service on the fragility uh, that is felt by people in a community. So the emphasis of those projects are flexibility, sustainability, resilience uh, that deliver a lasting impact, not just, oh, we did something, check that box, we provided for these people, uh, and not being aware of what comes afterwards when that fragility continues. 
And the emphasis is on contextualization, uh, adaptive learning. So learning as we go, there's always going to be challenges and that's going to derail a lot of efforts, uh, but being prepared to act flexibly with funding, with reporting, uh, and especially local leadership uh, that provides that contextualization and adjusting projects based on what's happening in real time. So for us, failure is an opportunity to grow in a lot of these, and that's a hard mindset to shift to sometimes. So uh, a, a challenge or an obstacle can be an opportunity to find a new way of doing something or learning from other people who have done it better than you have in the past. So this here starts. There we go. This is a map that we've created on some of our efforts in Mali. So this is a very limited view of the fragility that we found in Mali. But as you can see down here is our area working programs. And the little water droplets are our wash water points. Uh, and these numbers coming up are armed conflict events in which innocent people have died. Uh, so not combatants. And we see here, the closer we get to the, the present day, more and more have moved down to the south of the country where we work. So now it's no longer this removed uh, impact in the country where we're not really working there. It's not the people that we're interacting with on a daily basis. Now our staff, our programs are interacting with these issues on a daily basis and we're sticking it out and we're making it happen. And I think that's very important to, to, to demonstrate in some way. Another element of that is our climate impact. And we see this in Mozambique. It's a little bit kind of uh, busier, but we can see this uh, cyclone mortality risk and flood mortality risk uh, kind of overlaid with the dark green areas being where we work in the country. So especially in that Northern area, that's also the, the part of the country where conflict is also high risk. Uh, in the South, there's high flood mortality risk as well. And that's where our current project is being started. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a different way of showing that. And the hope for the, the next few slides here is the overlapping uh, form that fragility can take, where there's many, many different factors that build. And it's a cycle that if even if one is addressed or the impacts of one are addressed, many others will still come into play. So we'll start with the layer of flood mortality risk, cyclone mortality risk, that's slightly different and it makes sense why. Armed conflict points, which is a pretty even spread, but it's a very interesting way to show that. And here we have rat, rat, the raster by fatalities of the of the, uh, the aforementioned. So that's the fatality impact of those events. And now we're gonna look at population density too, because even though it's great to look at uh, where things happen, we need to know where the population lives. And this has been a really, really big challenge in mapping fragile context for us because, as we know in Bangladesh, there's some very, very large and dense population centers. And World Vision is a rural focused organization. Uh, and we don't work in these larger population centers. So that's going to weight very heavily away from the places that we work, which we'll see in this. These are the areas that we work. And if you wait too far away from where the people are the most vulnerable and farther away from systems, then we see uneven spreads. So even though it shows really interestingly how many different levels of factors will play into what impacts the community, it also shows that there's a lot of ways you can show that wrong or you can use data in ways that aren't fully reflected. Even then though, this area down in the southern east area is very close to Cox's Bazaar, so that's probably the darker area. Um, but that is also where we're implementing the next uh, focus project that we have. So even then, it still kind of works. This next part that we're going to be talking about, I'm going to invite Jordan Smoke, our director for WASH at World Vision US, to come up. And he's going to talk about our intentional strategic focus uh, in these efforts. Good. <clears throat> All right. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, good afternoon. Wow, seeing we're lonely. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so glad to see so many people here and interested in, in this line of work. This is certainly something that we have, uh, obviously, we've shown uh, so far in some of the slides Jonathan, Jonathan has presented, uh, just the, the level of interest that we have in it. From my standpoint, I'm just going to try to quickly go through from a, a leadership operational uh, decision-making perspective, some of the things that we're looking at and some of the things that we're thinking about 
as we move forward. Um, I'll just first say that, you know, from my perspective, I think that there's been obviously a lot of work in this area over the years. Um, certainly World Vision has a long history of, of working in some of the most challenging, difficult places uh, to go to. But as we, um, as we look forward in terms of the next several years in front of us, you know, we see a, a situation that presents characteristics such as um, certainly what we're all striving for in terms of improving overall services. We were Barbara on stage this morning talking about needing to, to address and improve quality wash services, but we've also heard reports in the JMP about needing to increase the, the uh, rate of progress and the multiplication factors that need to increase there. Um, we know there's rising operational costs, particularly in the past few years from inflation and um, uh, and things like that. And we know that there's a narrowing financial landscape as well um, from looking at, at financial tracking. And all this, as well as this continual shift into uh, more fragile areas, or even just as areas become more fragile in places that we're working. And so there's a lot of obstacles that we face out there. And so all the more reason to spend more time asking questions, uh, having conversations, uh, developing uh, new innovative types of uh, thoughts and ways of implementing. And so that's what we're really starting that process of really trying to, to dig in as an organization even and say, yeah, we've been doing this for a long time, but what are we missing? What should we be talking about? What should uh, we be discussing? And um, yeah, just to show you a little bit about what those investments look like for World Vision. So we um, we have a, a, a business plan that sets out goals for us. Our second goal in that business plan is deepening our focus on the most vulnerable, especially in fragile contexts. Um, so as Jonathan said, uh, there's it's it's hard to get localized, uh, be able to track localized um, progress in just localized types of metrics. So unfortunately, what you're seeing here is more at a uh, country uh, country level, but to show where World Vision is at in 42 of the countries we have in uh, investments for Washington, 31 uh, are ranked as a as a fragile um, country. We in the past three years now, so 21, 22, 23 have invested about 450 million in those areas, um, which is about 90 percent of our total funding, and uh, and that is equates to about. Uh, providing wash services for about 7 million people. But if we look even further, just at the top 10 uh, of those countries in terms of fragility, um, we're looking at 150 million invested over the past three years, which is about 34% of our total funding and, and 2.5 million people with wash services. So that's just a little bit quantitatively of where World Vision's investment is at. And we want to continue looking at that even in more detail um, so that we know that we're uh, targeting the right areas that our investments are going into the right places that are going to have have the biggest impact in this. And so, as a as a leader in approaching this, um, you know, we've also uh, I've noticed in conversations with people as well, there is uh, there is a tendency. While I think we often talk about reaching the most vulnerable or we talk about the needs there, uh, there is also evidence and actions of the need to look uh, or to implement in places that will ultimately be more successful. Um, we've seen both donors and funders as well as implementers actually make decisions in the past few years towards uh, a more uh, likely path towards success to find proofs of concepts or things of that nature. But in going about this work from my perspective, I think these are the things that I look forward to as we we push forward into learning more about implementing in fragile contexts, but it's giving ourselves permissions to it's permission to continue to challenge um, assumptions that we may have had and to relook at things that maybe we uh, we assumed uh, once were and and circumstances have changed. Permission to to make mistakes and to learn from those and and uh, and to adapt to rethink how we're tracking progress. Are we tracking the right things? Um, you know, it, it can't just be output focus. It can't even really just be outcome focus. We have to be looking and tracking at other things beyond that um, that Jonathan mentioned as well. And how do we communicate more effectively about this? How do we relate the necessity of this, but also communicate out 
um, how we're working through these types of risks to donors, to uh, international organizations, to each other um, as we go about this. I think there's a lack of just um, clarity around communication and how we communicate and talk about this as well. So as we look to go further as well, some of our implementation, uh, or should say all of our implementation will uh, revolve around these types of things, adaptability, um, how are we adapting under changing circumstances? Do we Are we flexible enough, willing enough to change? In having flexibility, are we in a position to make quick decisions based on things that are happening? Are we allowing others that are closer to where, uh, where implementation is happening, where decisions are being made to be able to make those decisions and have that flexibility? We've been in parts of many large uh, grants and types of projects where the chain of communication up to get approval to make uh, changes related to events on the ground is, you know, the bureaucracy is great and the results end up being uh, uh, very stifling to the work that we're doing uh, in communities. Um, redundancy is an interesting uh, word here, but it's, you know, we may uh, need to look at beyond just initial uh, solutions, right? We may need to be more considerate than just a primary water source, but what's a secondary water source? What's a tertiary water source, depending on how things happen? Um, how do we make decisions on designs, on financing structures, on governance structures, uh, where we can uh, purposefully, intentionally put in redundancies to help sustain and mitigate some of these uh, uh, fragile cycles that they're going through. And obviously context is important and having that localized understanding, not just at a country level, but even from community to community and understanding what are the needs, uh, what are the, the, the sensitivities that are taking place at a very local level is, is very important. So we'll hear about some of those examples. Um, if you want me to pass it out? All right, I'll turn back to John. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. So this is my favorite part of the, the session. Um, we're going to be talking to some of our uh, local experts, uh, Andreas and Zacharias, if you could come up, please. Thank you. Um, this has been very uh, interesting to coordinate. We had some colleagues that were going to be coming from Niger and some other places. And uh, with visa issues, this gets uh, tossed around quite a bit because the time is so complicated. So um, as we know, we're going to be able to hear a little bit on the challenges in Ethiopia from these two uh, wonderful friends and experts. Thank you. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, so first, for some of you who don't know where Ethiopia is located, <laughs> Just kidding. Everyone knows where it is located. Uh, you know, we are talking about fragility, and when you talk about fragility, you know, associating Ethiopia with fragility is common. So there are so, so many challenges, but I really want to focus on basic three challenges, what we are facing currently as we are passing through a very difficult situation. Um, uh, the, uh, as was concerned, the first challenge is uh, programmatic uh, uh target change you know as as any country Ethiopia is expected to achieve universal coverage by by the end of uh, 2030 uh, and this fragility context makes Ethiopia uh, going backward in two major ways the first one is uh existing infrastructures are you know damaged and existing service level is uh downsizing because in those fragility situations, especially most of actually our challenges conflict. So that makes actually our progress, uh, hindering our progress to achieve SDG. Okay, uh, hindering our uh, progress to achieve SDG target. That's the first one. The second basic challenge that we are facing in terms of programmatic change is uh, new investment cannot be actually uh, promoted, cannot be effective. Donors, government cannot implement actually exist you know, new programs and activities uh, so that with the existing program downsizing and with new programs, you know, unable to implement. Overall, we are actually uh, being 
backward in terms of achieving the SDG target. So that's actually one of our challenge programmatic aspects. The second one is a compromisation of accountability. So the communities are expected to you know, get the required service from the service providers. In our case, you know, um, government is the main service provider for WASH uh, services. So with those compromised accountability system, no one can ask its own right in terms of getting the right web service uh, from government because you know in the in those fragility, this strong accountability mechanism is actually broken. Um, the third basic thing is lack of proper supply chain mechanism mm -hmm. in those fragility containers. You know, uh, uh, production those production companies cannot produce the required material. Uh, transportation is compromised. Um, the market fluctuation affect, you know, the entire ecosystem of the market. So these are actually our basic uh, challenges. So inflation and it, this, this all thing is coming together, affecting again, our operation cost to implement wash programming. And again, uh, our investment cost to implement wash programming. So in a conclusion, these three basic challenges are, you know, in a vicious circle affecting the existing uh, programming in Ethiopia. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Zacharias um, with World Vision US team. So I just want to summarize and highlight what uh, Andreas shared with us. Uh, really just showing you know how how the context in Ethiopia is currently affecting you know wash services in general so speaking of really the context you would find pretty much all these three contexts at play in Ethiopia you could see conflict driving you know fragility you could see uh, political you know uncertainty around it as well as um, you know environmental or climate change related fragility so with that uh, you would i mean jonathan was telling us you know it is really difficult to talk about fragility on a national level what makes it typical in ethiopia the issue is rather national level. it is really spread uh, and it is not like contained in one in, in in one location in fact the recent conflict did you know did did increase you know the, the the fragility of like most communities in the northern part of the country the country like affecting three regions Tigray, Amhara and Afa and then you know with the conflict it goes to Oromia as well that's like the largest region in the country so fragility because of those three you know like uh, in play uh, contexts uh, is not contained uh, in one in one location. As a result, there is also a transferred fragility. It's not like you know in one location because of these things at play, but because of these things at play, the the issue of fragility is also really transferred to you know nearby cities or towns because why services would struggle because of influx you know influx of population or internally displaced people. So I just want to highlight those. And then, of course, it is also affecting right now, uh, you know, the cost of doing wash in general, significantly, you know, the, 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 the cost of, you know, like doing wash programming escalated so high. You know, those contractors, if you will, just like what Andrea said, you know, the supply chain and what have you, Factoring, you know, the, the, the risk at play, you know, those who provide some of the engineering services to provide wash services to the communities, you know, just build up their cost, you know, to match up uh, uh, the risk that is involved in them providing those services on the ground. So I just want to summarize, it is rather not localized, it is pretty much everywhere. There is also transfer fragility in the country and cost is also another challenge that that's right now at play uh, in Ethiopia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, we will go right ahead into it. 
D. Yeah, I'm both waiting. Oh, oh, yes. I didn't touch it. <laughs> it was that bad when I Uh, there we go. Okay. We'll just go straight into it. Afternoon, everyone. Can can I am I heard in the back? I know the mic's not great and it's not karaoke, so I don't want to be really loud. So um I'm Christy. I work with World Vision and I get to talk to my friend Noble Jay today from Zimbabwe. Um we're just going to hear from her. I'll ask a couple of questions. Um, but we're going to focus in on one particular aspect of fragility, economic fragility, looking at Zimbabwe. Um, so this chart just gives a very quick and simple example of um, kind of the impact of inflation and consumer prices in Zimbabwe compared to other countries that would be considered fragile over the last, what is this, since 2016. So you see, you know, Zimbabwe's off the charts with how high things have gone there. And now you see it's come back down, but it's still significantly higher, aside from Sudan, significantly higher than most of these other countries. So it's just a, a brief illustration of some of the impacts of, or what you know, the economic fragility in Zimbabwe. Um, so I'm gonna ask some, um, Nobuthe a couple of questions related to that. So maybe first Zimbabwe, no, <laughs> more coffee. Um, could you share a little bit more about what fragility looks like? in Zimbabwe and um, yeah, how it's affecting people's vulnerability. Thank you, good afternoon. You can hear me. Thank you, I'm Nobuse from Zimbabwe. Right, as Chris has uh, already alluded to, if we are to pick up all the factors which uh, contribute to a fragile context in Zimbabwe, we'll pick the economy. Our economy hasn't been stable for quite some time. So as we also implement some interventions to improve access to water, we do face challenges at organizational level and also at community level. So uh, our economy is not stable. We use more than one currency. We use our own currency, we use the US dollar. When you come to Zimbabwe, Christie, you can buy using your US dollar you came out from US. We use the rand, South African rand. We also use the ruler from Botswana. So our economy is not really stable. So that's one of the uh, challenges we face in implementing watch. Speaking into the uh, contractor supply system, it's not stable because most of the components and the equipment is imported from outside because the investors are not ready to invest in Zimbabwe because there are a a quite, uh, quite a number of risks to, to invest in Zimbabwe because today you are investing in this, mm -hmm. the next morning is something else and you are bound to lose. So investors are not ready to invest in Zimbabwe. So most of the equipment we use in uh, ensuring uh, access to water through installation of uh, infrastructure related to water scientists Sanitation and hygiene is imported from outside the country. So basically that's the background. Thank you. Um, maybe you can share now a little bit more about how these economic issues affect specifically your WASH programs from an operational standpoint. So um, how, how would you say this affects how you implement programs in Zimbabwe compared to maybe a similar program in, in what might be a more stable setting? Okay, in a, in a more stable setting, I will take, for instance, the issue of the downtime of our infrastructure. If you set up an infrastructure, if it breaks down, there is, the downtime in Zimbabwe tends to be long because of the access to equipment to maintain the infrastructure might be long because there's the issue of the importing, 
fine, but as World Vision Zimbabwe, we have tried to link up with the suppliers and contractors through the private public partnerships. So we have a number of contractors and suppliers who work with, we have contracts with, to, and we also link those suppliers and contractors to the communities where we have set the what? The system. So for sustainability and resiliency, the community where we have set up the system is also directly linked to the contractor and the supplier. So that the downtime is what is reduced whenever there's what there's breakdown. So also as we implement the wash related interventions, uh, we also try by all means to integrate them with other sectors like life loads. So in integrating wash and life loads, we are ensuring uh, that economic empowerment of our targeted communications so that they have a way of sustaining the water infrastructure which is installed. Mm -hmm. So as we implement WASH, we don't only run with WASH, we try to integrate with other sectors which might even affect our own WASH programming if it's not directly or intentionally targeted for. I will tell, for example, currently, I think as we're in the uh, session which we attended, I think we so saw when it comes to cholera, when they're talking about climate change and health, we're also recording a number of cases in Zimbabwe. So if we are to run with WASH and we don't look at other sectors like health, it directly affects the WASH interventions and WASH programming, at both at national and community level. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question? I, I appreciate how you're highlighting some of the complexity and the importance of kind of interdependence that, that there is for, with WASH and other sectors. Um, let's talk a little bit about people. I'd love to hear, um, you know, as an organization, a lot of us work for organizations that seek to reach the most vulnerable in the communities we're working in. Um, you know, in World Vision, we try to put particular emphasis on women, girls, people with disabilities, other marginalized groups. Um, so maybe you can share a bit, Nobuthe, about how economic fragility, the impact on people um, directly and how, how you're trying to help address those things. Okay, thank you, Christy. Uh, in terms of our targeted population, uh, our focus as well vision is the children. Then the nearest caregiver to the child is a woman. So our focus is the child, the woman, we are not forgetting the men. <laughs> so in most cases, as we do our water, water interventions, we, we mostly focus the primary caregiver is the woman. So we try by all means to uh, empower the woman economically so that we can have a transformed uh, wash programming in our communities. So in the fragile context of Zimbabwe, which is economically affected, uh, microfinance is not an option because the banks are not willing it's both sides, the banks uh, cannot give because they give you uh, 1,000 today. By the time you pay it back, it's no longer having that value. And even with me, if I get the money, I don't have that trust that I'll be able to pay back or I'll be able, the money I get today, by the time I use it or I get it from the bank, I'll do the same uh, proposal which I plan to do. So as the World Vision Zimbabwe we came, out, came across with some different approaches where we now target the community at community level, I think I'll speak into the savings for transformation, which enables the communities to have access to funds through forming groups like specifically for women, they form groups, they contribute money, they borrow from the, the money they have. Then the interest also comes back to them for them to start some interventions which, which they can also use to sustain the white infrastructure, which de they depend on for their life load activities. So we are trying by all means to come up with other approaches which suit the context where we are working in, mm -hmm. to, so that the, our communities can uh, resiliently and sustainably maintain the white infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, John. Thank you so much. 
that was very insightful. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Elise Mann. I'm the senior manager for the Global Wash program at IDE. Uh, for those of you that don't know or need a reminder, IDE works in 10 countries around the world, uh, building markets to solve complex challenges around climate, around agriculture, around wash. Uh, we work closely with entrepreneurs that already are working and recruit more to work with us. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about a specific program in Bangladesh. So while IDE uh, works in 10 places around the world, we have pretty limited experience working in fragile settings. Um, but in recent years, we've needed to start learning what does it look like to facilitate meaningful markets in fragile locations. So there's a lot going on this slide. I'm not going to talk to you about all of it. Um, but what I want to highlight is the ways in which we are trying to build capacity of local sanitation entrepreneurs. We're trying to strengthen the supply chain, and we're working on system strengthening. In 2017, um, as many of us know, over almost a million people fled Myanmar to Cox's Bazaar, which doubled the size of Cox's Bazaar. So UNICEF came to us and asked us to work on a small three-year project trying to build the capacity of entrepreneurs to deliver sanitation products and services. We're in this program really working to do the same types of tactics that we do across all of our programs. So that's engaging a lot of value chain actors. It is uh, building resilience, trying to create markets that are more inclusive and working through a range of existing methods, local actors, national, national actors, and regional um, to really promote the products that already exist. And building markets for sanitation is hard. Building markets for sanitation in fragile settings, also really hard. So what I wanna to talk to you about is the two biggest challenges we've seen so far is around distorted market impacts. Um, because there are so many uh, people that are there in the 26 camps and a large influx of development money of actors, there's a lot of free products, um, which is then really hard to incentivize people to buy additional products. Um, we do not work in the camps. We're working with the host community um, and with entrepreneurs to deliver across eight upazillas. Um, a huge issue we've had that we are still really wrestling with is with so much money going into Cox's Bazaar, people and organizations, the UN, are working with vendors and not going directly to entrepreneurs to order products and services. That means there's inconsistent prices and the margins that are already pretty low for a lot of the entrepreneurs we're working with are getting even less money. Um, and with so many more people, We've got pretty inconsistent labor costs. So what used to be uh, a more, uh, I wouldn't say viable, but an uh, option for people, now there's a bunch of different individuals, including those Rohingya in the camps that are offering labor. And that makes it a lot cheaper, which makes it then more difficult for people to make viable living. Um, the distorted market impacts, we haven't had a lot of success in coming up with solutions for yet. Um, we're trying to work with the vendors, we're trying to work with some of these larger entities, um, and it's still a huge challenge, which we also accidentally contribute to. So financial accessibility, huge issue. It's a huge issue in building markets for sanitation anyway. We know around the world there's extreme inflation and people just cannot afford. Um, and with so much money, going into the camps, there's not nearly as much money going into the host community. So for six months of a three-year program, we tried a voucher program. So as you see here, we distributed the vouchers to LPs. Then those LPs, sorry, latrine producers, too many acronyms, our latrine producers um, would conduct their sales and distribute their vouchers to eligible households. And that eligibility was defined in partnership with UNICEF and national guidelines. So then households could order the latrines 
pay a deposit uh, to the latrine producer. Latrine producer can go install the latrine, collect the remainder of payment, and then the voucher, and then come to IDE for the rest of the payment. So we had a huge spike in demand, which A, indicates that the subsidy was too high, um, and B, caused a bunch of additional challenges. So of a three-year program that had about 26,000 toilets sold, half of those, I think over half of those were during the six-month time frame. So people want toilets, that's great. Uh, but then we started having a lot of issues with quality. Um, LPs didn't have uh, the capacity, the production capacity, the labor to be able to deliver that many orders, which then undermined our ability to install quality latrines. And subsidies, while really important as a tool for delivering sanitation solutions, are expensive. And we know that financing is going down uh, for our space. So uh, we have lots of challenges that we are continuing to wrestle with, um, but it's something that we're trying to continue to learn so that we can uh, help entrepreneurs that are existing in these existing markets uh, to deliver. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elise. Next up, we're gonna have Ben come up and talk a little bit about how we learn in these contexts. Sure, and then I'm kicking people to small groups, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, so I'm Ben Tidwell, uh, I'm a senior technical advisor at World Vision. I lead uh, our research and learning efforts. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our approaches to learning, how we're thinking about this. I wanna start out by saying, uh, I am not going to have all of these prior presentations present all the challenges and I'm gonna give the great solution. So what I'm here for. I'm sorry. It seems like a lot of people probably came for that. Um, but what we're what we're really trying to do is is one come up with some better, more consistent ways to talk about different aspects of fragility. So we're not just painting with a broad brush. And two, to really then dive into not just wash and fragile context, but what are the actual services we're talking about? Are there ways in which those services? Uh, meet different challenges and different sorts of fragility. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about a framework uh, that we've uh, that we've started to develop and where that's come from, and then give you all some uh, some group work. I'm not sure how the breakout groups are going to go. Uh, so we'll wing that. But um, just to say, so so we started before I get into the framework, we started uh, not with uh, several of us or people that looked like me sitting in the U.S. and brainstorming what this framework might look like. We started with our national office programs. We have, as we saw earlier, uh, dozens of programs that have been working in these in these contexts for, for dozens of years. Uh, and so we started with what are the activities that they are already doing? And if we offered them an opportunity for a proposal to get additional funding, which, which we did, um, what kinds of things would they prioritize? What would they want to do differently than they're able to do now? What challenges are they facing currently? How would they uh, would they change those things? Um, and we realized that you know it's it's challenging to ask someone who is to speak for my colleague from Niger who is not able to come for visa related issues that are not just because of immigration systems, but because of uh, you know the consequences of fragility. Um, it's difficult to ask someone in Niger. How are your programs taking into account the fragility of your context when they've primarily worked in Niger for decades? Like it's it's hard for them to characterize, like it's 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 even an invalid question to ask, like, how does your program differ from a normal program? As if like a normal program exists and they are somehow abnormal. Um, and so what we really try to do is say, what is it that your programs are doing? How can we learn from your approaches? How can we categorize? How can we come up with common terminology so that we can start to talk about this and learn from this? And you can learn from each other, not, not us getting in the middle here in the US or wherever else, uh, but how can, you know, how, what can someone in Bangladesh learn from someone in Mozambique? Probably not to copy their program, but probably not nothing. And so how do we start to bridge that gap? So just to run quickly through this, very drafty, very much designed by me in PowerPoint. Don't blame our graphic design people at World Vision for how ugly this is, but hopefully the concepts are interesting. So World Vision is a child well-being focused organization. Obviously in WASH, we're not only working directly with children, we do plenty of other things, but this is our main goal. 
And in our WASH business plan, we have four main technical approaches. These probably look familiar to all of you, even if you use different terminology for the kinds of things you do, but things like water supply and quality, sanitation, hygiene, governance and finance, uh, water security and resilience. And when we think about fragility, we try to think about specific aspects that affect, affect our wash service delivery. So Jonathan mentioned earlier some of our, again, these are uh, sort of terms that are not at all meant to be like perfectly scientifically distinct and unrelated as nothing is really unrelated to, to, to other challenges in a fragile context. We thought about political and economic fragility, uh, climate fragility, and uh, conflict-related fragility as uh, potentially overlapping and potentially in some ways synonymous, but, but distinct in terms of conceptualizing our interventions, uh, aspects of fragility present in these areas. And so we started to think about, okay, how do we start to learn what our programs are doing and how do we give them guidance for this sort of uh, development process that they were going to do? Um, and we thought about two things, really. One was so we have obviously this focus on child well-being, but we want to also try to figure out how do we capture impacts on the context itself? How do we capture what are, what are the characteristics of the context that we would use to label it as fragile that we could then actually measure the impact on? It turns out there is really not a lot here in terms of great gold standard indicators. So academics in the room, please, please, you know, help us out here. Uh, we found like a fragility exposure index from 2015 that was cited by three people. And that's about as good as, as, good as we got, uh, other than sort of national OECD things like that. Um, so we wanted to focus on not just the, the actual impact on households, but how to affect the context. Uh, and then secondarily, we wanted to give them some, some, handles onto what do they do differently, right? So this is just basically sort of an augmented uh, kind of program planning cycle. So uh, a, a sort of assess, plan, do, measure kind of framework, but with some just very basic terminology around assessing layers of context, not just a household, you know, JMP service level assessment, but how do we assess their experience of these different um, aspects and dimensions of fragility. Some capturing of the planning uh, with flexibility and long-term focus. So not just uh, this is where we're going to do water points this year, but where are we going to get uh, in, in the long term? And what, what are the kinds of things we might adapt to? And how we do those adaptations? Uh, something about actually documenting the changes. So when I call this a, a learning project, it's not an RCT. It's not with a third party evaluator, because what we're wanting to do is show that, yeah, we're so great at this. It's really trying to say half of what we want to learn is what do people actually deal with in their day to day that they don't document because it's not going to go into a quarterly report and it's just too complicated. And if they're just held to account for how many toilets that people in, you know install in your area, like they're not going to document these sorts of things. And then finally, measuring multiple levels of change. We talked about a little bit before looking at fragility. Uh, direct indicators of fragility, um, sort of more uh, community or uh, societal level kind of norms, things like that we can measure. So with that said, this is, again, not our uh, brilliant academic to be published, uh, you know, for uh, one for all time academic framework. This is more uh, we are trying to think in our programs about what it is that we do. And so then to follow on that, we have uh, about 15 minutes set aside now where uh, we would like to hear, uh, I say we, we're gonna break into some small groups uh, that will have to be a very sort of tightly moderated small groups that'll be more like one person talking at a time rather than an active debate because this many people debating in four groups is probably not gonna go well. But what we really wanna do is talk about, we have these aspects of these technical approaches we really want to hear in some of these groups, not, uh, you know, your perfect silver bullet solutions, but we want to start thinking through what are the ways that you see these three different dimensions of fragility affect these specific technical areas, these technical approaches. Um, are there particular ways that that some of these aspects of dimensions of fragility affect these, some of these more than others? And then we also want to get to a second question here, I'll actually go to the question slide. So what are the challenges that each dimension of fragility brings, but then what are the most promising approaches for delivering services in the technical areas? And so again, this is not, um, uh, we, we often reference there's, you know, work on WASH systems and WASH systems in fragile context. This is not meant to, uh, to compete with that, but to say, I think there's a piece here where what we're not wanting to look at is the sort of building blocks of system, but what, what is it those systems actually need to produce? Uh, you know, World Vision, we're often thinking a little bit more like sort of closer to the household 
uh, just given our focus and our and our skill set and our, our position and partnerships. So uh, those of you who have been designated as small group leads, if you could stand up. All right. So I don't know how reshuffling people is going to work in this room, but we'll give it a we'll give it a shot. Um, okay. So uh, water security and resilience. Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, why don't y'all go to the back over there? Um, sanitation and hygiene. Why don't you? You're already up here, so we can go up here. Uh, governance and finance. Right here, you can be in the front, and then water supply and quality. I think is y'all. Yes. 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 Andreas. Andreas. Okay. Uh, back over there. Um. For those of you that don't want to participate in the discussion, that's actually okay because you know <laughs> not drink for everybody, so we'll just self-select a little bit. We get research process. Um, over there, Andreas. Yes. So we'd love for you in these groups, and this isn't you, you only have time to go to one of these groups, apologies. Um, but we'd love to start a little bit of a conversation around approaches you've seen be successful in these kind of technical areas across different dimensions of fragility. And then we'll try to share back a little bit at the end with our uh, group leaders and note takers. Yes, Andreas, you're pointing at me. Over there, that side, over there. Okay, I can't hear you. I can see your arms waving. One more time. So water security and resilience is the back corner over there. Timothy and Sarah, please raise your hand. Um, sanitation and hygiene is here with Elise, hopefully keeping the theme of her presentation. Uh, governance and finance is up here, Jordan, uh, and the only easel in the room, so we'll have good notes up there. And water supply and quality in the back corner, Andreas and uh, Zach. Yeah, I think we're going to all right Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. 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 I